Back in June, I declared Ratchet & Clank my favorite video game franchise. I also made a promise to deliver 4 videos solely focused on the IP, so here we are with RNC Month. I found it appropriate to begin this event on November 4th, since that's the franchise's birthday, and this anniversary in particular is very special. Ratchet & Clank are turning 18 years old, meaning they can finally drink and drive, which not even Nathan Drake is old enough to do. Read it and weep, Nathan Drake! I had originally planned to kickstart this RNC month by talking about my personal history with the franchise, but plans have changed. I'll instead release that video at the end of the month, whereas today, I will be ranking every RNC game, which also acts as a fitting introduction to this month. Like my top 10 favorite video game franchises, this video idea has also been years in the making, since ranking the games in the series is something I do on the regular. That's not to say ranking them is easy though, and I'm still not entirely sure if my current ranking holds true. It's also bound to change over time, as it has done in the past, although I am quite certain about some of my decisions. I have revealed some of my thoughts on these games before on the channel, whether I straight up talked about them or simply implied by showing visual cues. I've especially been very upfront about them with close friends, so most of my placements may not be that surprising, but I doubt it would be easy to predict my whole list. By the way, if you didn't catch my last video detailing RNC month, just know that whatever game ends up being number one on this list will have its own separate review video next week, so I won't be talking much about it in this video. With that intro out of the way, it's time for me to finally rank every Ratchet & Clank video game. They're currently being 15, so it's basically a top 15 countdown. To probably no one's surprise, unless you didn't even know this game existed, before the Nexus is at the very bottom. I don't hate this game, but I don't like it either, as it's very simplistic, not very fun, and a worse version of Subway Surfers. I don't like phone games all that much in the first place, but I'd much rather play Subway Surfers, which I did actually spend a lot of time playing back in the day. Before the Nexus is quite challenging, as you can die pretty easily from getting hit or crashing into things, so I've never gotten far into it, nor do I care to, since it's simply not entertaining enough. That's mainly due to its weird controls, as using touch to both position ratchet and shooting at enemies just feels wrong. I'll give it credit for managing to tie its story into the Nexus, which explains the title and why the Prog Twins are involved, but it being a phone game, there's not much of a story to speak of. The weapon selection is actually pretty good, but they don't feel satisfying to use, so they probably could have been replaced by any other weapon and there wouldn't be much of a difference. The music seems to be entirely recycled from Tools of Destruction, which isn't some of my favorite music in the series, but it's definitely preferable over music composed by Michael Bross. It is a shame that the game doesn't offer any new tunes though. I can't think of much else to say about this game, nor do I want to, so to conclude, I guess this game is alright for a phone game, but can't quite compete with the other RNCs. I like Size Matters considerably more than before the Nexus, but I'm still not a fan of it, hence why it's placed so low. In fact, I probably have more issues with it, but it's above the phone game because I care more about it. That doesn't mean much though, since I've never even finished Size Matters, and I'm not sure if I'm willing to either, especially since I hear the final boss is infuriating, and it's probably at its worst in the shitty PS2 port I have. The game was originally released on the PSP, and I'm sure the game's better on there, but I'm not interested enough to buy them. This game has very poor graphics for being released in 2008, that look bad even compared to the oldest PS2 games. It is a port of a handheld game, but it still seems ridiculous that the 6 year older original looks amazing in comparison. Another problem is the gameplay, as the movement is really clunky. That's especially the case with the unpolished minigames, like the dreadful skyboard and those awkward challenges in the Clank Arena. The writing is also a weird aspect of this game, but it does have some funny bits, and is probably not the worst written game in the series, so it's not that problematic. The weapons are fine I guess, but among the weaker ones of the series. As for gadgets, I only remember the one that lets you water plants to clear obstacles, which is pretty creative. The environmental design is too, and while that dream sequence was hard to get through, I love the idea of it. It was cool seeing so many tributes to past RNC games, in particular Ratchet's Garage and Clank's apartment, although it sucks that Jack and Daxter aren't referenced, and that the pyramid console can neither be used nor destroyed. The soundtrack might not be as good as it was in prior games, but it's still really good, as it was composed by David Bourchot, who's by far the best RNC composer. 
Overall, size matters has a few positives about it, but far more negatives that outweigh them, so I don't consider it a good game, at least not on the PS2. Its best aspect might just be its name, and there are funnier titles to come. It probably comes as no surprise that High Impact's other RNC game closely follows, but it might be surprising that I prefer the Clank-centric game. That's because I found it both looking and controlling better. Okay, Ratchet's gameplay isn't good, but it's a minor part of the game, so I'll let it slide. At least I would think, since this game focuses on Clank, but just like Size Matters, I haven't finished Secret Agent Clank either. I stopped right after the section you play as Quark, where he imagines himself a giant, taking on another giant, Terror of Tallow style. That was a cool set piece, but I have to admit that it dragged. Since I didn't play much of this game, I don't know the whole story, but it seemed fine, and Quark seemed entertaining as ever. Basing a spin-off on Agent Clank made a lot of sense, even though it's a tad weird that it's taken so seriously when Clank himself confirmed that it's just a fictional character. It did make for some cool James Bond imagery though, not to mention music. The soundtrack might not be among the best, but it has an identity of its own, which made at least a few tracks memorable. The visuals are very flashy, environments having a cyberpunk feel to them. I suppose they're a bit one-sided in that sense, but at least they're pleasant to look at, and not all of them are like that. I would be lying if I said this game looks good for PS2 standards though, especially given that the port was released as late as 2009. The game also carries over some clunky designs from Size Matters, but Clank controls surprisingly well, save for the rhythmic sections. Sneaking past lasers is easily one of the worst designed segments in RNC history. I had trouble on the dancing section too, but already got used to it by my second attempt, so it wasn't so bad. It also has personality to it, with either Clank or his dancing partner getting hurt by background hazards. The snowboard chase afterwards was a neat callback to the Secret Agent Clank movie that pretty much every RNC character saw in theaters, but it went on for too long. That seems to be a common issue with this game, but I still enjoyed what I played of it more than size matters. Overall though, I'm not a fan of this game either, and I don't know if I'll ever care to finish it. Next game on the list is not only the last RNC phone game, but also the last RNC game that wasn't made by Insomniac. Most fans would probably put this lower, but from what I can remember of it, Going Mobile was dope. It's the only full-on 2D RNC game, and since 2D games usually age well, I bet it has less flaws than the previous games I've listed. It's a very minimalistic game, but there's a certain charm in its simplicity, not to mention nostalgic value, as it looks like an old 2D platformer. Even though it is a small game, it packs a lot of RNC elements, like the helipack, swing shot, titanium bolts, crates, teleportation pads, and even an arena. It also has a few weapons from Going Commando, so it's nice to have some more Megacorp representation, even though they're definitely inferior iterations. Same with the Rhino, but it's impressive that this game has one when not all RNCs do. Other references include Ace Hardlight posters and Maximilian being the final boss, which is neat. The game's biggest downside is that it doesn't have a soundtrack, other than the title screen theme, which is honestly pretty catchy. There are sound effects, but not everywhere you'd expect there to be. So yeah, you can tell this is a very amateurish game, but I still somehow find it appealing, at least more so than the other non-Insomniac RNCs. I haven't finished any of them, but I would actually like to revisit Going Mobile and finish it. That's why it sucks that it's on an old phone I don't remember the pin code to, and I haven't played it in over a decade. Maybe I'd place it lower if I actually went back to it, but I'm letting nostalgic uncertainty win here. I played it way before the Nexus, Size Matters and Secret Agent Clank, and my memories with those are largely unpleasant. I can't see Going Mobile going higher than number 12 though, even though I'm not very fond of the next entry either. Now we move over to the RNC games that were made by Insomniac, all of which I finished, but I haven't necessarily completed them all, which is the case for Full Frontal Assault. While I don't think it's a bad game per se, it's by far the worst RNC Insomniac has made. It seemed promising, since it allowed for free camera control and leveling up weapons again, which all for one removed, but the gimmicks prevented it from feeling like a true return to form. It's again a co-op game, but this time there's a tower defense gimmick, and you have to reclaim your weapons in every level by locating pods. I'm not such a fan of these gimmicks, so this game wasn't really for me, although it is dope that you can use the amazing hover boots whenever. 
The game barely has any levels and is basically on par with Quest for Booty's length, but it's still fairly repetitive, since you do the same uninteresting tasks every level, except for the last, but that one's just underwhelming. The final boss, however, is actually pretty good, despite how cringeworthy Stuart Sergo is. He was apparently in Going Commando as one of the least memorable side characters that you won't even meet unless you go out of your way. The concept of him is interesting, being a former Captain Quark fanboy who wants revenge after realizing how terrible Quark actually is, but Sergo just falls flat with his cringe-inducing dialogue. Another letdown is that the Q-Force was assumed to return, given that Quark reassembles it, and that's the European title for the game, but it's just Quark naming the trio of him, Ratchet and Clank that, without the other Q-Force members returning. I guess you can make a case for the Starship Phoenix making a return, but this second edition is so lame, as it's a bland hub where there's nothing to do, and looks ugly on the outside. Also, a trailer for this game tricked me into thinking Talwin would finally make a return, but it turned out to just be a costume for the online multiplayer. It's nice that there's an online mode, but I didn't spend much time with it, and RNC's multiplayer modes have been better in the past. The comedy is mostly miss, although I will admit that I got a laugh from Sergo hacking the Phoenix 2 to play the Trollolololol song, and that his Groovitron dance is Gangnam style, but those memes are kind of outdated by now. The graphics are too, and the soundtrack is forgettable. This game came out around RNC's 10th anniversary, so you'd think it would be a proper celebration, but instead, it's the worst RNC Insomniac made. Still, I do enjoy it more than the previous entries, if only for being more polished, and the gameplay is still quite fun despite the boring gimmicks. It's nowhere near the top 10 though. We're now entering the top 10 with another short RNC game, which has the stellar name Quest for Booty. Unlike Full Frontal Assault, this is actually a good game despite its length, and that's because it's practically DLC for Tools of Destruction, meaning it plays, sounds, and looks great. It doesn't innovate much, but the new wrench's kinetic tether is a notable addition, as it finally gave the wrench more flexibility, being able to pull bridges out and springs in. The gameplay has a great foundation, but it's sadly really bare bones beyond that. You only get 7 weapons in total, all returning from Tools of Destruction, and they can't level up much. What's worse is that they're not naturally maxed out by the end, and since you often can't revisit areas, grinding is a chore in this game. That also means you can permanently miss hidden weapon upgrades, but it's not like they'll take long to collect on replays. You can't even return to Hulufar Island once you've reached the final level, and that island acts like a hub for the game. It's very pleasant to explore, due to the laid-back music and lack of enemies, and the tower challenges are quite fun and varied. The cave areas have very captivating atmospheres too, with haunting pirate themes playing in almost complete darkness, hadn't it been for these faint lights wrought by lamps, enemy fire, and these green blobs. The outside of Darkwater Cove is also cool, and offers some neat puzzles about mixing drinks and composing music. This was sadly the last RNC game David Bershow composed, but he left on a high note, as the pirate themes are so epic and memorable. I really like that the whole game is pirate themed, as the pirates were some of the best elements of Tools of Destruction. Rusty Pete and Captain Slag are probably my favorite characters in the game, they're such an entertaining duo. Even then, the best moment was undoubtedly Dr. Nefarious making his long-awaited return, now that made my brother and I super excited when we first finished it. That being said, my biggest problem with this game is the story's missed potential. It could have been so much more, but it got heavily restricted by the game's short length. Talwin suffered the most, since you'd think there would be some sort of payoff to her arc, but it feels like she's just there. She should have reunited with her father Max Apogee, or at least found a clue of his whereabouts. Not only would that give a good explanation for her absence in a crack in time, but it would also tie neatly into Ratchet's current quest of finding Clank. It's such a missed opportunity, and if this game had been longer, it could have been one of the better RNC games, but as it stands, it's at the bottom of top 10. All for One is the last darn C game I would put in a below average enjoyment tier, but I do find it a little better than Quest for Booty. It has some good ideas and is overall an enjoyable experience, far more so than the other spin offs, unless Deadlocked counts. Just like Deadlocked, this game has co op, but the difference is that this one's designed around it and can be played with up to four players instead of just two. Granted, I barely played it with others, since I rarely ever play games online, my brother didn't want to play it, and I didn't ask many friends, but it's still decently fun by herself. The gameplay is obviously nowhere near as good as peak RNC, but it's an interesting change, and I like the loop of sucking your companions, shooting them out, and grappling yourself towards them. 
The game is honestly very creative, offering various gimmicks that mostly work, like platforming across floating rocks in a low gravity zone, flying jetpacks to slam through enemies and walls, and grinding on supersized rails, adding a new dimension. The designs are well thought out, especially since a lot of them are made with teamwork in mind, which can get troublesome in single player, since the AI won't always respond, but it works for the most part. The weapons are fine, but none of them are among the best the franchise has to offer. Not even the Rhino 6 Proto suit, as its ridiculously low ammo count kills its lasting appeal. The set camera is probably my least favorite aspect of the game, since it makes searching areas tedious, but it does highlight the game's pleasant atmosphere. I don't care for Michael Bros' music, but it does work for this game, and the main theme is actually good. So are the visuals, with many unique new creature and level designs, which is impressive considering the game mostly takes place on a single planet. The only bad thing design-wise are the character models of Ratchet, Clank, and Quark. They're easily the worst they've ever looked. The framerate has also been nerfed, since this game released right after Insomniac decided to stop running their games at 60fps, so that was a lame move. The writing is probably some of the worst the series has to offer, but it's still quite decent. The story has an intriguing mystery aspect to it, and while the idea for the villain is bland, it does show personality while possessing Mr. Dinkles. The humor is more kid-friendly than before, but it still has some fun adult jokes sprinkled in every now and then. The worst thing about this game is that it's a big letdown after the high of a crack in time, so the flack it gets is understandable, but I think it's a tad overhated. I too would rather play most other RNCs, but All For One is a good spin-off. While the previous RNCs aren't even part of my top 50 favorite video games, these 8 are all part of my top 20, and that's because they have the classic RNC gameplay that I absolutely adore. Even so, I do have some problems with them, especially Ratchet & Clank for the PS4, otherwise known as the game based on the movie, based on the game. I have a love-hate relationship with this installment, because on one hand, I love the super polished gameplay and mostly faithful recreations of levels from the original, but on the other, it doesn't do the original justice. For starters, the music is really uninspiring, with only a few good tracks, my favorite being the one on Planet Kerwan, but that's because it resembles the amazing Kerwan theme from Tools of Destruction, and it's weird that it also plays on Planet Gaspar, where it clearly doesn't belong. A lot of the music don't fit the locations they play in, and they're awfully bland on top of that. The visuals are thankfully amazing, you'd think they would be when the game was developed alongside an animated movie, and the level recreations are brilliant. The character animations, however, are oddly static, at least in dialogue scenes. It is like that for certain interactions in most games, but even certain open-world games that contain far more are livelier than these. The game's lowest peaks come from the writing, as it's so childish and sloppy. A few jokes hit, while most others are lame as hell, and the story is very badly paced, and has multiple plot inconsistencies, the worst one being that Ratchet somehow knows about Nefarious despite never being told about him. The returning characters are pretty much the farthest from their peaks they've ever been, with Ratchet being a complete goody two-shoes who instantly befriends Clank, instead of having them slowly get used to each other like in the original. Quark's redemption was rushed too, considering it took him one game this time instead of a whole trilogy. He also talks too much, and the fact that he narrates the game doesn't excuse the bad writing. Drek has gotten the worst treatment, since he's now goofy instead of intimidating, and gets insultingly replaced by Nefarious as the main villain, who shouldn't even be in this game. Aside from a few exceptions, the new characters are also underwhelming, especially the downgraded squad of Galactic Rangers. The flaws don't stop there. Even though I like the new holocard system, some of them display incorrect information, which you'd think the makers of RNC wouldn't be able to mess up. The roster of weapons is good, but most of them are recycled from the future series, many of which have overstayed their welcome. Lastly, while the level recreations are great, not all the levels from the original returned, making the game shorter than it should have been. Wow, I sure have lots of problems with this game, so how the hell is it number 8, let alone one of my 20 favorite games? It's simple, it perfects the traditional RNC gameplay formula that I love so goddamn much, and it often triggered my nostalgia successfully. As a game, at least as an RNC game, it's not that good, but I do still enjoy it a ton. After the snooze fest that was full frontal assault, Into the Nexus felt like a true return to form. 
Well, it was still far too short, but it was an incredibly enjoyable 6 hours of gameplay. There are only 12 weapons, but that's not bad for such a short game, and they're surprisingly unique. I'm particularly fond of the flashing nether beasts, and the Omni Blaster was a refreshing starter weapon. You can actually test weapons before buying them, which hasn't been possible since up your arsenal, and the Raritanium upgrade system from Tools of Destruction returned as well, so those were much appreciated comebacks. The game also has many neat additions, from the cool grab tether to the addictive gravity leaping. The clank sections are the most different they've ever been, as they're 2D and also revolve around gravity, but they're fun, and don't overstay their welcome. The best addition has to be the jetpack, as that made for such fun traversal in some of the planets, especially Thram. That's an open world collectathon that allows for free use of the jetpack, as well as the hover boots. Now that's a match made in heaven. There are only 6 levels in this game, so all of them had to be long, and while that worked well for Thram, some other levels unfortunately suffered as a result, especially Planet Silox. That's actually a very fun level, but the problem is that the look of it becomes straining on the eyes. It has one of the worst uses of Bloom I've witnessed in a game, and it doesn't help that the game tends to drop below its meager 30fps standard. It's fortunately not too bad elsewhere, but it shouldn't even be an issue. Planet Yerik nails presentation, as the caves are so effectively haunting, and the foster home is covered in disturbing details. I'm still not a fan of Michael Bross' music, but the low-key tunes do work in the spooky atmosphere's favor. Also, the main theme is actually great, especially its catchy bit tune variation. The writing also goes for a darker tone, although it's still quite silly. Tawin finally returned after her half-decade-long absence, but as usual, not much was done with her. She's only really there to mourn the loss of Kronk and Sefer, and while that was sad, it seemed to only be done for shock value and to give merit to the darker tone. The writing is overall decent, but for being labeled the epilogue to the future series, it feels like filler. The Prague twins do make Ratchet think about his earlier motivation of searching for the Lombaxes, but nothing really comes out of it. Similarly, the Dimensionator gets brought back too, but also ends at a standstill. I didn't even like that it got fixed, since it's such a powerful device that should at least be reserved for a more consequential plot, but I guess that's what Rift Apart is for. My favorite writing in the game comes from the museum, as the Torbot conveys fascinating lore in a very entertaining manner. You can also interact with some of the displays, even a by obliterator boss that's unironically better than the one in Up Your Arsenal. It might not be a traditional Insomniac Museum, but it's still an excellent treat. In spite of its length, Into the Nexus has a lot to offer, and while it's too short and inconsequential to rank higher, it's a super fun game that was a very satisfying return to form. Into the Nexus might have tried to go for a darker tone, but it is Deadlock that is the true Dark Lord of the series. It's super edgy, but it works, because the game owns that style. Just look at Ratchet's armor, it's sick. The environments are harsh, but very cool looking, and contribute to the intimidating nature of the game, though I will admit they lack detail compared to before. I don't like the soundtrack as much either, but it's still my fourth favorite in the franchise, as its music is badass and fits the tone perfectly. The writing is also more mature, featuring more swearing, but it's never overbearing and only adds to the comedic factor. There's some good satire, like the glorification of such a violent sport like Dreadzone, corrupting role models for business, and commentators promoting certain competitors while leaving others in the dust. Those commentators are really entertaining, especially Dallas, and I never get tired of hearing him repeat, Run, Ratchet, run! The main villain Gleeman Vox is really entertaining too, as he's such a mad lad who does everything in his power to make Dreadzone exciting. He truly highlights the game's consumeristic themes, like when he talks to Ratchet about future deals. What a good performance that was. I like how mature Ratchet becomes, but he seemed uncharacteristic at the start. He took pleasure in the fact that he got abducted to take part in a deadly competition, even after knowing that plenty of heroes died from it. The pacing is also odd in regards to the four exterminators you face. You get to know a lot about Ace Hardlight, as he is your main rival, and I'd say Shellshock and Reactor got decent characterization, but there was almost nothing on the Eviscerator. It's also weird that Shellshock had a longer boss fight than either of them. Deadlock devolves the gladiatorial arenas from past games, creating a full game based on those, which sounds very repetitive in concept, but the great execution made the challenges diverse and interesting. It works due to the brilliant combat, which is honestly the best in the series. The weapons lineup is really small, as there are only 10, but it's probably the most consistent, since every weapon has something to offer. Yes, even the Hollow Shield, which sucked in up your arsenal. It might be useless on easier difficulties, but it's essential on 4-5 stars, which I usually play on, since I prefer the challenge. 
Weapons can actually be leveled up all the way to level 99, which doesn't take as long as you'd think, and turns weapon fire into rainbows. Weapons can become even better with a variety of weapon mods, which alleviates the small size of the roster. This game isn't designed for co-op, but since this game is such a blast, it's by far the best co-op experience. While I absolutely adore the combat, the game doesn't have my favorite gameplay overall, and that's because it's missing the crucial exploration component found in most other RNCs. There are skill points to earn and jackpots to find, but the maps are so empty that it doesn't feel the same. There's also no clank on Ratchet's back, and the game does work without him, as you do get these two very fun and helpful robotic companions, but I much prefer keeping the duo intact. These are the primary reasons Deadlock isn't higher on my list, and isn't part of my 10 favorite games either. It is number 11 though, and it's definitely better than the prior games I've discussed. We've reached the top 5 that are my 5 favorite games ever, so no matter how this ranking looks, there should be no hard feelings. That being said, I never thought I'd see the day where I'd put Tools of Destruction at 5th, as it used to be number 2, and I used to complain whenever someone else would place it that low in their RNC ranking. Even so, I still fucking love this game, as it has some of the smoothest gameplay ever. The camera's movements, Ratchet's movements, 60 frames per second, just everything control-wise is perfection. It might not innovate much, but it perfects the amazing RNC formula we've come to know, and does offer a lot of new levels, weapons and gadgets. This game introduced Grummelnut, and although their weapons would eventually grow tiring, they were really fresh back in the day. Mr. Zircon actually used to be really cool, and the Groovitron was mind-blowing. I still love it to this day. It's just great seeing everyone dance to funky beats. This game introduced the Raritanium upgrading system too, which isn't as good as Deadlock's mods, but it's a nice alternative. Another sweet thing about this game is that it's one of the longest RNCs to date, and that's because it has a lot of levels. They're quite sizable too, so it's a good thing I love the selection, even though a few of them overstay their welcome, and while I like the ship sections, they're easily the weakest link. Planet Sargasso is my favorite, as it's a collectathon like Thram, but I love Sargasso even more. The Robo Wings may not allow for combat like the jetpack does, but it has way smoother controls, and it's one of my favorite gadgets. I also love the Gelinator, which had some really fun platforming, and the Gyrocycle offers some cool obstacle races. When I first played this game, I was blown away by its presentation. This was the first RNC to be released on a stronger console after all, so seeing Metropolis in HD was insane. It might be my favorite starting level, because of its sheer scale and chaos, and the background theme is incredible too. It's sadly the only song I love from this soundtrack, and that's not to say the rest is bad, but only Kerwan compares to the PS2 music. I love Ratchet's redesign, although it does look a little rough nowadays, and the same can be said for the aged visuals, but some environments still look pretty 13 years later. What keeps Tools of Destruction from going higher is its writing, which I do think is good, but I much prefer the writing in numbers 1 through 4. I'll give it credit for adding a lot of new interesting lore, but it wasn't really necessary, and it did set the franchise on a crash course. Quite a few retcons were made in this process, the most notable one being that the Lombaxes are extinct, which was never brought up before, not even when Ratchet met Angela Cross, who's forgotten to justify this retcon. Also, the series tone changed a lot of what RNC used to be. In the PS2 games, almost every character had the ability to be funny, whereas here, only a few of them are entertaining, like Rusty Pete and Captain Slag. It wouldn't necessarily be a problem if the unfunny characters were interesting, but they're sadly lacking depth. Even Ratchet seemed to regress a bit, as he for some reason doesn't trust Clank. It made sense in the original, since they just met, but they've been together for years at this point, and Clank's visions prove Ratchet wrong every time. So to conclude my thoughts on Tools of Destruction, the gameplay is most definitely top 3 material, but the rest just barely keeps the game from going that high. Ah yes, the highly esteemed up your arsenal, everyone's favorite, and I put it in fourth. While I love this game, I do find it the most overrated title in the franchise, which is in stark contrast to Deadlocked and Tools of Destruction, but the writing of 3 pushes it above them. The story isn't the most compelling, but man oh man the comedy is completely hysterical. There are so many funny line deliveries and iconic moments that are impossible to forget, and Dr. Nefarious is a big contributor. He's just so extra, and I love how his butler Lawrence responds by subtly roasting him. They're such an amazing duo. 
The best character, however, is Captain Quark, who acts like such a cheeky cunt towards the main duo, talks about screwing a monkey, and cross-dresses twice. He even has a compelling redemption arc, starting from rock bottom thinking he is a monkey, then regaining his memories and foolishly leading a ragtag group, later faking his death to escape responsibility, and by the end actually manning up to face those responsibilities. Ratchet and Clank may seem tame in comparison, but they also have their moments, like when Ratchet imitates Courtney Gears or improvises at Quark's funeral. Clank has more badass moments than funny ones, but his clone Clunk actually has some gems every now and then, like when he insulted Quark at his funeral and had that epic mic drop on Miss Gears. Other members of the Q-Force are also cool, Scrunch joining most missions, Big Al figuring out the complicated stuff, and Skid McMarks going out in the field despite being scared. Skid in particular are some of my favorite moments in the game, I just love his dumb mannerisms. The Galactic Rangers are also lovable cowards, and their conversations are funny as hell. The gameplay of Up Your Arsenal is where I start questioning why this RNC game in particular is usually rated the highest, as a lot of it honestly feels uninspired, thus making for a repetitive experience. The levels are so linearly designed and rarely have gimmicks that make them unique, and Obani Draco that is unique is over in a flash. Also, the returning planets from the original have been done so dirty, all of them lacking detail compared to their counterparts, and some even being simplified multiplayer maps. I do have very fond memories with the multiplayer, but it took away from the main game. There's a lack of racing, space combat, and even grind rails, which not everyone is a fan of, but they're part of what makes RNC what it is. There aren't many additions either, but I'm so thankful for the Captain Quark vid comics. Not only do they unfold a hilariously captivating backstory between Quark and Nefarious, but they're such a joy to play too. They're 2D with fun combat and platforming challenges, and they even contain a couple of cool boss fights. The whole game has a slew of great boss fights, Dr. Nefarious being my favorite in the series. Fighting him is so much fun, since his attacks are varied and he's fairly challenging, plus the atmosphere is through the roof. I wish the presentation would be that good for the whole game, but it's sadly lacking. Many levels have the same color palettes and aren't very detailed, save for a few exceptions like the Obani Moons, Quark's Hideout, and Koros. Those also have sick music, and the soundtrack might not be as varied as prior ones, but it's so amazing that it doesn't matter. As you can see, I have quite a few problems with this game, and while I do find it overrated, I can't deny how hard it's made me laugh. Here it is, the original Ratchet and Clank, the game that started it all, the game that has stuck with me the longest, and the game that has fluctuated the most in my ranking. It used to be my favorite, until a crack in time overtook its position, then it quickly fell down to 5th place, behind Going Commando, but in front of Deadlocked. Then when Into the Nexus released, I think I put the original just behind, and I was debating whether I preferred the PS4 reimagining. Well, I've cleared my head since then, as it's definitely better than Into the Nexus, and there's no way it's worse than the PS4 game, as that one disgraced the original, despite improving it in numerous ways. The factor that made me rank the original lower was its dated gameplay, but I've grown up with it and replayed it countless times, so I'm more than used to it at this point. Looking past its dated elements, it's actually incredibly fun, as it has a lot of great ideas that form a varied experience. The weapon selection isn't among the best, but there are some fantastic gems, particularly the Tesla Claw and original Rhino. It's a shame that the auto aim sucks and that strafing is absent, but the game is designed around it, making for a methodical approach to combat, so that's cool, but it's definitely not perfect. Neither is Clank's gameplay, as it's very slow and simplistic, and while that's not a problem for the short and atmospheric Nebula G34 section, the Orcs on one overstays its welcome. The other minigames are also flawed, but still very fun. Controlling Giant Clank is sluggish, but also epic. Dogfighting is fun, but it could have used a dodge. And hoverboarding is sick, but the controls are a bit sensitive. The bosses are alright, but the final boss against Drek is amazing, being varied, challenging, and epic as hell. Now for what really boosts this game's ranking, starting with the incredible atmosphere that might be unmatched, despite being the first game in a still-running series. Every area has so much detail put into them and captured the space adventure vibe perfectly, as everything feels grand in scale, while still being tightly designed. The beautifully varied environments are enhanced further by the magical soundtrack that provide pleasant calming themes and funky tunes in even dreary looking places. The character animations are also impressive, especially considering these are from 2002. 
it helps that the voice acting is stellar, really selling these cartoony characters, which transitions nicely into the wonderful writing this game has to offer. The story in this game is very simple, but also really engaging, as it has proper setup, foreshadowing, callbacks, and character development. I love how the relationship between Ratchet and Clank isn't perfect from the get-go, Ratchet acting brash, just wanting to have fun, and Clank being logical, looking at the bigger picture. That makes it so satisfying to see them eventually come to an understanding and set out to stop Chairman Drek's evil plans. Drek might seem one note, but he's got personality, belittling others with sarcasm, and being very extra without seeming like it. Captain Quark is also a villain, making for an interesting twist, as he's propped up to be this amazing hero, but turns out to be a cowardly sellout. He's thus very interesting, and packs some good comedy on top of that. The side characters you meet are really entertaining too, and the conversations with them are so snappy, especially the one that introduces the plumber. Now that interaction flows so well. As you can see, it's the fantastic atmosphere and great writing that pushes this game so high on my ranking, and although I love the gameplay, its flaws prevent it from going even higher. Still, number 3 is not bad at all, and it's amazing how after all these years, I still revisit it. Given that A Crack in Time was the first RNC game to surpass the original for me, it's fitting that it's one notch above. But if this game impressed me so much, why isn't it still number one? I'll get to that, but first, allow me to gush about this masterpiece. Its gameplay is smoother than the already perfected movement of Tools of Destruction and offers even more engaging elements on top of that. This is the most innovative RNC game since Going Commando, which is really impressive considering it was released six years after. Most of the game has Ratchet and Clank separated, which you'd think would be to its detriment, but their individual gameplays have never been better. Clank sections are mostly decent in other games, but they're legitimately amazing here, as Clank's movements are sped up, he can jump thrice, and the Chrono Scepter gives him more combat options. Also, his level design offers unique platforming challenges, in addition to some insanely creative time puzzles. Ratchet's gameplay also feels fresh due to the addition of the incredible hover boots that are like charge boots with more mobility and can hover like Clank's packs. Even the ship gameplay has gotten a much welcome overhaul, as you can fly all over space sectors and visit spherical moons. Speaking of moon, this game has the best Insomniac Museum, as it's much bigger than the rest and has a cool atmosphere to it. Tools of Destruction and Quest for Booty looked really good, but there's a noticeable leap from those to a crack in time. It's honestly one of the prettiest games I've ever played, and I think it looks better than any future installment. The pre-rendered cutscenes in this game are the closest to movie quality RNC has been, discounting the actual movie of course, but even then, I find these cutscenes more appealing. It's probably because of the lighting, as well as Ratchet's amazing model. The other characters look great too, especially Azimuth, who sports such a cool color combination for a Lombax. Outside of cutscenes, the game still looks great, with such detailed and varied environments. The Great Clock in particular is a marvel of science and sorcery, and I love how Dr. Nefarious' space station is modeled after his head. This was sadly the first RNC to not be composed by David Bouchot, but while Boris Alchow's music isn't as good, it fits the cinematic feel very nicely. I was criticizing the direction Tools of Destruction's writing took, due to its massive tonal shift and retcons, and even though A Crack in Time does continue these trends, I still adore its writing. Yeah, having both protagonists become chosen ones was contrived, but I really like their roles. They both seem like the most mature they've ever been, and I love their determination to see each other again, making for an incredibly heartfelt reunion after being apart for so long. That also made some of the last moments of the game heartbreaking and heartwarming, thinking they would separate again, but ultimately staying together. The most compelling character is Asimuth, who desperately wants to bring back the Lombaxes to atone for his failures. His motivations tie neatly into the time focus, since rewriting the past could accomplish his goal, but he realizes too late that attempting to do so could destroy the universe. It was shocking, yet understandable that he betrayed Ratchet, but he ultimately sacrificed himself to correct his mistakes. A captivating character like Asimuth is something I wanted from Tools of Destruction, and while the other characters aren't all that interesting, they make up for it by being entertaining. Orvis and Sigmund are charming keepers of time, and the different species you interact with make the galaxy feel more lifelike. 
Nefarious and Lawrence finally returned and they're hilarious as ever. I love the way Nefarious went out, absolutely losing it. It's just a shame it didn't stay dead. Captain Quark isn't at his peak, but I still find him funny, having some quotable lines, and cross-dresses yet again. So, I pretty much love everything about the crack in time, flaws and all, but it is the worst soundtrack and flawed writing that keeps this game from remaining my favorite. It's a close second though, and I wholeheartedly believe that this is one of the best games ever made. It's an easy guess now, but Gone Commando is my favorite video game, and I'll explain why that is next week in a separate review video. That was my ranking of the Ratchet & Clank games, and although there are a few stinkers, I still love the franchise with all my heart. Before ending this video, I want to quickly make a prediction of where I think Rift Apart will land on this ranking. I have no doubt the gameplay will be its best aspect, which looks terrific, so far having shown some fresh new weapons, a cool swing shot alternative, and even a new dodging mechanic that looks like it'll come in handy. I love how the game takes full advantage of the PS5's extremely quick load times, really hammering home the interdimensional theme. The visuals are also amazing, even though I'm still a bit iffy on some of the character models. I've come to accept that the music will probably stay bland, but I'm worried about the writing as it comes on the heels of the worst written game in the series and will tackle the aftermath of Into the Nexus. Maybe continuing the main plot means it will be good, but I'm not keeping my hopes up. With all this in mind, I think Rift Apart will end up being my 7th favorite game in the series, placing above Into the Nexus, but below Deadlocked. That's all for now, the first week of Ratchet & Clank month has come to an end. I'm Arcadon and hopefully you'll see me next week.